Good morning, everyone. Um, so uh, today I'm just going to talk about ex uh, managing externalities in the functional world. Or uh, there's another title of this talk, which is what we can do to ensure the sustainability of Elixir and to basically make it uh, more sustainable even 10 years, 20 years in the future, a few ideas and also a few things from the past. The goal of this talk, as I said, is to try and find certain ways to transform Elixir from a tool uh, that's using anger, a very sp uh, specific and niche tool, to a tool of choice, even in our own niche, perhaps, but uh, to transform it so, so we, can, we can reach for it without justification. In order to, in order to uh, think about this problem, we have to first look at the past. So I prepared a few, uh, a few bits um, from the past, really, that we can look at. The first bit is from 1994. So um, you're probably familiar with this paper. It has been, it has been shown earlier um, in earlier, uh, I believe, Erlang factory talks. This is an experiment um, conducted by the US military on the programmer productivity of, uh, of several different programming languages. So, so as you can see, it's a little bit over the place with C++ and Adlin Orc and Haskell. Yeah, so just going to go over it very briefly because you probably already know about the content of the paper. It's about a hypothetical ill-defined problem uh, where you have two ships, one is a master, one is a slave, and you have two aircrafts, one is civilian, one is uh, potentially hostile, and they, so the ships are stationary, the aircrafts are moving, and over time you want to print when the aircraft enters certain doctrines and when they leave. So um, basically the military got uh, programmers in different languages and they asked the programmers to program them and they got the results. And the results were very dramatic uh, with the Haskell programmer delivering something that actually works and has a, short, uh, has a smallest number of lines of code. You can see that relational lisp there on the list has uh, fewer lines but it didn't work so it doesn't count. Um, <laughs> It was so dramatic, the, uh, the project uh, office basically got a college graduate to redo the Haskell program without prior knowledge of Haskell, because they thought, okay, this probably doesn't count, so it did it again. So you can see Haskell reappeared again at the bottom of the list, uh, like double the size of the program, but uh, it still worked. So, so you think, okay, so this uh, study was now in 1994, so all military systems must be in Haskell then, yeah? The answer is no, it didn't happen. Why? Because there was some kind of confusion. So quoting the author of the paper who wrote the original Haskell program, there was some certain confusion because the program, uh, uh, the authors were convinced that the program was incomplete, it was too small. And somebody said, oh, okay, it looks clever. Somebody, somebody else said, it, it could be a little bit uh, better, it's cute, but it doesn't seem extensible because they're using data and code interchangeably. And somebody, tried to say that it was too cute for its own good, but uh, due to the protest of the author of the Haskell program, it was removed from the paper. Right, so what did he, uh, what did the author conclude? He concluded that there are certain, uh, there are certain sociological and psychological barriers to further adoption of functional languages, and these barriers must be overcome. Uh, it didn't quite say how to overcome, though. He did say that maybe we need to have some killer apps and we, we need to have some commercial support. Okay, so this was not the first time somebody was, was annoyed about functional programming not being adopted, and obviously not the last time. So in 2004, somebody else wrote another paper. So Mr. Wattler actually did appear in a previous Erlang Factory uh, session. Uh, so he wrote, uh, wrote his uh, summary paper, which is a, a summary of his prior ACM uh, columns. So he said that functional programming languages have certain adoption inhibitors or adoption barriers. And he, he wrote, uh, there are seven. So first one, compatibility with existing, existing libraries in C or C++. Second one, availability of libraries written in the language. The third one, uh, portability, I, I, wrote a langu I wrote a program that runs on Linux, can, can I run on BSD or so on. And also ease of installation from deciding to install the language to having an environment that works, how long does it take? First one was about uh, the size of a footprint because they were thinking about, okay, I have this good functional language, I want to embed it in the desktop application. So how large is it? Uh, you can see the games industry embed uh, overwhelmingly uh, Lua because of the footprint. So this is a valid point still to today. 
I would categorize these four inhibitors as uh, technical. And then there are three other points. The first one is the availability of commercial support. Because in a commercial environment, uh, if somebody doesn't come with commercial support contracts with an external entity, uh, with whom a contract could be struck, then uh, it doesn't exist. It has to have commercial support. It also has to have uh, training for people who are used to other forms of programming. And lastly, the popularity and social proof of such a language is actually important according, according to the paper. Because um, with a continuous track record of successes, it's easier to persuade non-technical people to adopt functional programming languages if they, if they ask you, basically. So he did say that Erlon did it right, and there were certain right steps taken. Because Ericsson grown, has grown language in a very deliberate manner, um, according to the paper. It said they evolved the language in tandem with its application, work closely with developers and provide documentation, courses, hotlines, and consultants. So according, according to the paper. So we can look at certain cure apps that, uh, that have come on the market. So some said uh, with killer apps, it, it would be possible, like just with killer apps, it would become more popular. Uh, we have seen many already. So the original Ericsson switch, although it's mostly C, uh, according to, to the footnote, uh, Erlon Factory Talk in 2010, which you can take a look. Uh, WhatsApp uh, is based on being the old Facebook chat, which they replaced because uh, they wanted something else. Uh, and also certain modern companies also use, uh, use the Bing ecosystem for, to their great benefit. So you can see the killer apps are you know, not few. There are many of these. But uh, in summary, these existing papers focus on how to sell functional programming to organizations that are more established. So, so they mostly focus on the psychological and, psychological and non-technical barriers to adoption. So what has changed in today's world then? Um, all of that, of course, is, is irrelevant if you change the context in which uh, you are considering adoption because, because it, it boils down to good technical management. And if you have good technical management, then it really doesn't matter whether you're using a functional language or, or a non-functional language as long as you can manage it correctly. So if you look at Elixir's attributes uh, today and compare it to the technical inhibitors, you can see for these four attributes, like uh, lack of bindings, well, there are many ways you can, you can bind a C, C or C++ library to Elixir. It is not trivial. I would admit it's not trivial, but, but it does work. And it works every time if you know how to do it. So it's fine. And regarding libraries, we have 7,000 packages on Hex, I believe. Uh, so, so that's great. Uh, portability is great. You can install from Homebrew. You can pull an image from Docker Hub. You have, you have nerves for writing embedded Elixir. So that's great. And for footprint, basically, it is not so much of an issue in 2018. Uh, to be honest, 2018 is, is time when we all ship you know, embedded V8 engines in desktop applications and we don't use native libraries for UI. So I would say that uh, footprint isn't really an issue. And if you run Elixir on servers, that's even better. You know? So it doesn't really matter. And how about the non-technical uh, non inhibitors? So um, I would say that uh, what has changed primarily in today's world is the acceptance of alternative delivery models to waterfall. So for example, this is, uh, this is basically learning, learning selection or the non-tech version of agile development. Uh, it looks very much like a super of agile development chart, but basically what it says is, initially you may have an idea, it may be plausible to people who are non-technical, and as long as you talk with your users and talk with your stakeholders more and more, and constantly, and deliver you know, small bits of stuff constantly, you will eventually reach um, the level of knowledge and understanding required for widespread adoption. So, this is not heresy today, and it is actually basically actively being carried out. So last year, uh, I talked about how to sell Elixir primarily against certain common, uh, or say, common perceptions that inhibit the adoption of Elixir in a technical organization. And I would like to believe that these still stand true today. So if somebody were to say that this technology is new or unproven, then what they really perceive is there is an implementation risk involved in that uh, if we go with it, we may not be able to succeed within the amount of time we have. 
So the antidote, of course, is you, you make a prototype early and you make it end to end. So you can demonstrate that it works and if you want to scale it, you can scale it properly. The prerequisite, however, is that, well, you need to actually have time to do this kind of stuff. Sometimes this kind of stuff isn't actually scheduled. So you will have to find a pocket of time somehow to make sure that you can actually deliver the prototypes uh, to a certain quality, unfortunately, if uh, the culture isn't there. The second point um, is that the technology maybe is not standard. If somebody says, we we're a Java shop, we're, we're a Ruby shop, or we're a Scala shop, why use a functional programming language? Then what they really are saying is that uh, they don't want to manage multiple stacks at the same time. They want to be able to manage a single stack. Uh, and I would probably interpret this as some kind of, you know, some kind of issue with centralization of control. And the only way you can, you can solve it is by decentralizing control. However, the solution will be up to the individuals. And one of, these, one of the solutions is to, uh, is to take some control back, but at the same time, committing to additional uh, KPIs or key performance indicators. And by doing that, it is possible that you would then be able to, to have more control and have ability to, you know, to you know, get away from the shackles of centralized IT. So somebody may say that this technology is very obscure. They don't really understand it. Uh, what, they're, what, what they're really saying, perhaps, is that they won't be able to find additional programmers. They won't be able to maintain the application properly. Um, I had uh, some sentiments yesterday uh, in a meeting that somebody wanted to write the, uh, the program in Elixir, but, but they were the only person in the company. So they were rejected the opportunity to write Elixir because um, the company feared that if a de developer were to leave, then nobody else will be able to maintain it. So, well, uh, the, the question is, why, why would you push something to production with a single developer knowing it only? But I guess that's a product management question. However, this uh, basically points to a need for share code and for professional development. So uh, what a team really wants to consider isn't uh, the knowledge they already <coughs> got, but uh, the velocity at which they can acquire additional knowledge if required for the technical bits that are shared you know, between different products. And of course, the product-specific knowledge that cannot be learned from outside will have to also be, uh, be captured and also reproduced in a reproducible form like a shared wiki or something else that's suitable for your team. Once you have it, and you know, just ensuring that your team is engaged with the community, then you will basically obviate this risk. In summary, essentially uh, what's different in today's world is that we have basically democratized control more widely. And by democratizing control and sharing the implementation risk, um, you actually do get additional technical freedom. So this is very similar to the model uh, in which the skunk works actually operated. Because, uh, the, because the structure of the skunk works is that the customer wanted uh, low, qual low quantity, high quality, niche, hard to engineer, hot items yesterday. And with this kind of uh, cultural context, it is actually very, very simple and very easy to introduce additional engineering methodologies because as long as you ship, all is, for, uh, all is forgiven, basically. So with that in mind, this is a difference we're, we're seeing in today's world. We can look into the future. So, Looking back to Elixir, today I would perceive Elixir as a hyper, uh, basically hyper-specific language in a hyper-specific tool chain, which is well-built, and it's in a niche, which is you know, handling of a large number of connections, perhaps. But, but this niche is, uh, is getting increasingly popular. And it does have somehow a lower ad adoption barrier compared to its big brother. I wouldn't, I wouldn't actually necessarily ascribe it to the differences in syntax, but it seems like the adoption barriers are lower. Anyhow, uh, so what does the future have in store for us? I have prepared three different projections of how the future may look like for Elixir in 10 years. And then we'll discuss why these projections differ and how we can steer, uh, steer the future towards the one that we actually wanted. So possible future one of Elixir is that it becomes completely normalized. It's hyper-normalized. It, it takes the place of Java 10 years ago. 
So in this situation, what you will see is that it becomes some kind of a default. It's a safe choice. Uh, some people go to conferences, but most of them go to conferences on the company's money. So you don't see people paying for conference tickets with their own money. This is what, what you see in a hyper-normalized community. And you know, it encourages people who, who write you know, toys and you know, who write, who write more, more of art and code would have moved to a different language because it's more cool, it's more edgy, it's more, uh, you know, it's more le or say it's less mainstream. This is future one of many. <laughs> the second future will be uh, what I call altruistic uh, domination where, well, we've been very good at doing what we're doing and 10 years later, we're still very good at doing what we're doing and the core team doesn't seem to have stopped. And basically, it's a skill up version, I, was, I would think, of what we currently have. There's a third feature, which is that uh, Elixir remains a niche language in 10 years. And somehow, we have the same level of engagement. We have the same level of uh, technical uh, completeness. But um, you know, it, doesn't, it doesn't achieve a wider adoption. So this is feature number three. And of course, there are certain other futures that you can, you can come up with. I, I think you can go to like eight or nine if you were really wanted to try. The conclusion is, the differences between these futures is that you can't uh, just drive adoption of a piece of technology with technical excellence alone as uh, exhibited in the 2004 paper. So what we need to do is uh, to ensure that the parts that are not technical are also uh, given adequate and commensurate attention. The quality of people in community uh, in particular for an open source project is more important barring significant corporate investment. So um, I did show you earlier the, uh, the report from 1994 of a Haskell programmer complaining that Haskell isn't actually used widely. Why? Because we don't have X, we don't have Y, we don't have Z, and so on. And your, uh, your conclusion may be, okay, so we point fingers at, at the military, then, so, so we just ignore them. But this will probably be a dangerous attitude because uh, what you see in that paper uh, basically describes the attitude of people who control trillions of dollars of major steerable investments. And they basically uh, are from the same group of people that uh, funded indirectly the internet we see today. So I think there are several things that we can consider uh, today uh, as we uh, go through the other sessions. First of all, is that we need to deliberately take certain actions to ensure the long-term viability and sustainability of the platform we currently love and we continue to love. Second thing is, um, potentially this will come at a certain kind of alignment that we seek between technical concerns, commercial concerns, community concerns, and also personal concerns. So hopefully we'll be able to have full alignment with, uh, between these four concerns, but if not possible, then a partial alignment would probably be necessary in order to ensure that we can do the same thing in 10 years. Right, thank you very much. Thank you, thank you. Questions? So, no? Are you being shy? Yes. Okay, go. Well, um, mm -hmm. What impact do you think uh, technology trends like deep learning, artificial intelligence, neural networks, and that type of thing um, have on language adoption? Because I can think of one other language that's quite popular right now because it's tied into, you know, a, a, another, like a, a sort of a type of uh, technological uh, development like uh, neural networks. I think it will boil down to the risk tolerance levels of the different industry verticals uh, that we're talking about. For example, um, if you ship software to an established firm or an established organization, what they will give you is a set of specification, a set of what the software needs to do, what the software must do, what the software cannot do. And you will find that uh, there's, these specifications would probably be molded by certain prior understandings of the person writing specification. It may actually look like it was cut out for 
projects implemented in a certain language. Uh, on the other hand, if you're in an environment which uh, is more risk um, tolerant and more flexible with the implementation of technology, they just wanted something yesterday, then uh, this would not be a problem. So, so I think it, it would depend on, on the vertical you're looking at. Oh, yeah. um, when it comes to uh, the futures that you mentioned there, uh, the three of them, I think we all want the one where Elixir becomes a new Java. Um, if that was to take place, um, how do you think that will impact um, the current landscape of the industry um, that we're in? Um, well, I guess part of the conference of Java is that you're able to pay your way through most of the problems, including the deficiencies in the official runtime. So um, if Elixir were to become a more widespread you know, bedrock of the enterprise, um, then you will be able to spend more money and have fewer, um, more larger scale problems. Yeah. Hi, thank you Hi. for the talk. Of the f three future scenarios that you outlined, which would you say is most likely? If you had to, if you had to predict one, less or more? Yeah. Um, well, I would say that uh, keeping things as is will be the most likely if we don't do anything because uh, it requires the least amount of adjustment. But that is my personal opinion, and you need to keep in mind that my views are limited to what I can see, not what I cannot see, and I'm only one person. Oh, yeah. Last one. Uh, thanks so much for the talk. Um, just growing on, on what, you, what you just said, perhaps, um, some of these issues seem to be around an ecosystem of languages and uh, different people trying to solve a range of problems. Uh, in terms of the, the kind of the competing languages or the technologies that are kind of coming to the fore, how do you see how do you see Elixir kind of shaping up to the challenges and the, the community that we have kind of shaping up to the challenges of like the ecosystem? Um, I would say that Elixir's challenges are related to its currently smaller size of core, uh, smaller number of core contributors. So. Uh, if, you, if you're in a place where every single library depends on, a, on one or two core contributor, and sometimes multiple libraries depend on one contributor, but the libraries are very stable, then essentially you won't have small problems, but you may have larger problems that, of, uh, that basically occur much less frequently. So it's not saying that you, you won't have problems, but you will have a different class of problems, at least uh, from what I'm thinking. So uh, having more people uh, understand the language, understand how it works, having wider adoption basically is kind of an insurance policy against these uh, scenarios. Because okay. we, we can't just tell people to not write libraries, yeah? Job security. Uh, thank you, thank you, thank round you. of applause. <laughs>